How many of you guys donated blood before? I show you. Only the teacher? Two, three. Donated blood. <laughs> That's why I'm here today, to try to encourage you and persuade you to uh, donate blood at least every six to eight weeks. Um, according to the American Red Cross, statistics show us that one donation can help save the lives of over three people. And the American Red Cross is responsible for 45% of the nation's blood supply. By being a blood donor, you're not only saving the lives of others, but you're also saving your, your own as well. By anyone's speech, you will receive the proper guidance on how to become an eligible blood donor. You receive facts on blood usage and how it was used. I will give you five minutes reasons why people also refuse to give blood. In order to give blood, you must be at least 17 years old in most states. There are some states that you can at least be 16, but you need a parent consent in order to be able to do it. Um, you must be at least, you must weigh at least 110 pounds because your body has to be able to tolerate uh, the blood removal. Um, if you take prescription medication, they have to see why you were prescribed that medication. If you're one of those people that has prescribed marijuana, that's a whole other speech. <laughs> um, if you were, if you traveled in a country where malaria was found, you would have to wait at least three years in order to do the blood donation. Um, if you've been to a country, you've been anywhere where black counties was found, you can't donate blood at all. I found that pretty interesting. And here's an interesting fact I heard about blood donation according to the American Red Cross. A newborn baby has at least one cup of blood in his body. An average adult contains 10 to 12 pints of blood, and only one pint is required for the donation. And that one pint can save to three lives. If you begin donating blood at 17 and donate every eight weeks until you're 79, you would have donated 46.5 gallons of blood. Can you imagine how many lives I can save? Um, the problem is only 38% of us actually donate blood, and that's pretty bad because people need it out there. And then my favorite fact that I found was that the reason why people donate blood is because they want to help others, and that's good. Now that I have been interested in the United States, I can tell you why people refuse to give blood. I'm afraid, some people say, oh, I'm afraid I'll get AIDS. Come on, it's not the AIDS, they give the needles and stuff. Um, some people say, I already did it. If you say I already did it, you can give blood every six to eight weeks, though. You can at least do it five times a year. Um, I didn't realize that blood was needed was another excuse people used to not get blood. Every two seconds, someone is in desperate need of blood. More than 38,000 donations are needed every day in communities across the U.S. Some people say, oh, I'm too busy. If you can't take one hour of your time, if you take one hour of your time, it can mean a lifetime for someone else. And the, the, the most popular one is, I'm afraid of the needle. <laughs> the only way to overcome the fear of the needle is to conquer it. To conquer that fear just by making that reality. That's just a what if. And think about it. What would happen if one of your relatives was a death your blood? You would want someone to be there to, want to donate, right? Because that was a that was a case in I went to my country a couple of years ago and there was a there was a little boy who needed blood, but nobody had his blood type. So if they would have had his blood back then, he would have been he would have been saved. And in conclusion, as, as I explained, the blood donation and that just means you're helping someone. But you're also giving them life, hope and existence that will change upon them forever. Thank you. All right, Adrian, what did you think? And speak loud enough so we can get it on camera. Uh, I thought it was a, thought it was a pretty good speech. You know, sometimes like, it just felt like it was a bunch of facts. Uh, like, I felt like on some of like, the subjects, I feel like it's a little more, but if you had your point, you just need like, a little bit more like, detail into it. Uh, yeah, like, you had like a posture, you were doing like you were nervous. And uh, it was a pretty good speech. What did you think about the evidence that he did present? Me? Yeah. Oh, um, it was pretty good, like I was saying, like, uh, you just need, like, a little bit of, uh, like, where it came from, like, you know, where it came from. So maybe that would help a little bit, too. 
All right, Eric, I think uh, there are a lot of things in the speech that are pretty, pretty good. Um, there are a couple of things that are a little bit problematic. I like uh, the idea of the introduction. Most of the stuff in the structure there is good. The audience survey was a little bit awkward, but you follow up the survey with a good statistic to try to draw us in, and you're very clear about your, what your goal and objective is, and you have a good layout of what the structure is, which is fine. It did seem a little bit odd to me that you are talking about the solution before we talk about the problem a little bit. You need to tell us about uh, how widespread the need is for blood, uh, what the reasons are, you get into it finally about what the reasons are that people kind of resist donating uh, blood in the first place. What are some of the problems that happen when there's not enough blood or not enough blood of a variety of types to go around? And maybe punch in a few stories, like the one kid that you mentioned, apparently he lived someplace else, some other country, and uh, you know, there was a kid there. If you had a couple more examples of stories like that, it would be a little bit more emotionally involving. Because uh, you got a lot of good factual data from the Red Cross about what's needed to be able to donate blood. And so it, that part's a little bit more like an informative speech. Here's what's required in order to be able to do it. But it would be more persuasive if you're saying, here's how we can address this particular problem. And it would feel less like you're just giving us that list of data that Adrian was talking about. Uh, the conclusion of the speech, I think you need a little bit more summary and reminder of what your goal was. Because it seemed like you, you got finished pretty quickly there. Uh, it's only a four minute speech, so there's plenty of room for you to put some more information in. Um, let's face it, this is an everyday subject people can do, and you've got an audience survey, it looked like less than 25% of the class had donated blood, and if you're going to do the survey, you know, forget just the question of have you donated blood, how many of you have donated more than, you know, once or twice ever in your life, and you might find that the number is relatively small then. So trying to get people to become regular donors, I think, is ultimately what your goal is, that five or six times a year that you mentioned. And I think that that's uh, a good objective to have. Uh, your voice is okay. Uh, you project pretty well. Your eye contact, you're very dependent on the script. I think that you need to work away from that a little bit. And it sounded to me, like when I'm listening to you, as if you are gaining confidence while you're speaking and you are in more control about what's going on and you know where you're going there, which is all stuff that that's exactly what you want to do. You just need to take that extra step to get the rest of the speech that way too and I think uh, you're going to be in better shape. Like I said, I thought the problem with the time is that it's just a little thin. Uh, in the argument. You've got a good subject here, you've got some good information here, there's a pretty clear structure but it needs to be filled in. It's more of a skeleton of a speech and you need to add a little meat to it. Alright, thank you.